So I don't really have, I got like maybe some guide questions, but I wanted to kind of just like we did on the phone the other day. I thought that was awesome how we were just able to, yeah. I felt like I was just talking to an old friend. Like I said on the phone, it was, I just had this gut feeling that we'd headed up in that, you know, sort of uh, rabbit hole geeky way. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I'm sending you the message. Thanks for having me on. And um, uh, I really love what you're doing with your channel. You know, you're, perspective on things and you know what, what I find really refreshing about what you're doing and I guess it's kind of funny because it's part of the name of your channel but there's a beautiful simplicity <laughs> to the way that you talk to your audience and go through things it's hard to explain but it's it's um it's not condescending I feel like you want to share your enthusiasm for what you do with other people yes. and and I hope that they pick up on the contagiousness of it and that's that's different from what a lot of, a lot of other people are doing on channels yeah i'm also a photographer uh and i'll see sort of camera based channels and i'll i'll i've got to turn it off after someone's reviewing something and i'm just like oh god i really don't care <laughs> like are you are you shooting with this camera or are you reading a manual to me Right, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, as an engineer, one of my one of my heroes uh, was, you know, Bruce Redeem, rest in peace. And I remember, I remember this like really well because my old band was, you know, it was like late nineties, and uh, you know, it's like like teenage me uh, embraced the internet like really. Um, hard early on mainly because i'd moved to austin from florida and i was doing a lot of studio where they're like assistant engineering and at various places and a lot of that was in exchange for like my own studio time but and you were still dealing with a lot of tape and i was doing a bunch of stuff at criteria and a oh, shameless plug and uh thanks to them for this uh but i'm actually wearing my criteria nice. t-shirt yep. um so I yeah, did a bunch of uh, stuff there and, and various other places and stuff in my family studio. But they got into the internet like very early on, or at least the, because the, this is back in the day, like big studio for everyone paying like thousands of dollars a minute. Um, and they had like one of the first iterations was this stuff, I think it's called Dolby Facts that Dolby made, uh, which totally ties in with the audio movies. It's basically the first time that had happened and you had someone come over to your studio and install like i guess it was a precursor to a dsl line i think it was a cool a t1 line and you could transmit stereo audio to anywhere in the world that had it as well so you could mix in uh there was a delay which is why it was only stereo but you could be on the phone with someone and they'd be mixing uh, and that's what they were using it for if you had producers in london that wanted to use their own studio but the client was in florida so uh, the dolby came and installed this line and i remember it's like 25 dollars a minute something like that it was crazy wow but you know there was money and then that right before i left there that sort of dsl became a thing wi-fi was was not but the studios had like, like hard wired ethernet stuff so the i got to embrace the internet like early because of that and then moved to austin wi-fi was no i had a dial-up line <laughs> <laughs> and um at my, at my little apartment but you know my bands we started selling cds online we started we made them ourselves and in my house we burned them and we printed out the artwork and it took off, which was, which was great. But that's when I discovered like forums, there were like eight of them. And I've been right. working late at night <laughs> and uh, it's probably all like AOL based or some, something. No, what was that? What was the name? I'm trying to remember the name. It was like an early name, forum name. Uh, KBR? Um, KBR was KBR. pretty good. 
Yeah, maybe it was because it was like a precursor to whatever forum I was on was a precursor to Gear Slots. Because ah, okay. a lot of the same people moved. People I did chat with were on Gear Slots later. So maybe it's maybe it was the same forum, actually. They just changed the name. But there was an engineering forum. And Bruce Woodin, who I guess had just discovered the internet, jumped on. And he was on there for a while. And wow. once people realized who he was, they would start asking him questions. And, but they were the like craziest questions, uh, like super, super technical. Like, well, you know, because he was a Harrison console. That's like, if I'm using a Harrison and I do this, like, you know, 4K here and blah, 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 there. And, um, you know, then they start talking about early days of plugins and ratios of digital to analog, blah, blah, blah. And it just got really unnecessarily uh, uh, geeky in the wrong kind of way. Right. The technical and aspect Sweden of it. And Sweden left the forum um, with, um, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he bailed on it and left it with a sign off that was all caps that said something along the lines of, will you guys just use your f-ing ears? Wow. <laughs> and be- yeah, because <laughs> ultimately that's what it comes down to. Right. And if you listen to the kinds of records that you discuss, the kinds of records that ultimately that's what it was about. You had basic engineering skills, of course, or very advanced from experience. You knew how to put a microphone in the right spot, but, did it sound good? I don't care how many hands were on the console or what what frequency you're sweeping. Yeah, I mean, I remember part of what I learned from the, the great people I watched and, and just how that inspired me was like doing things like just closing your eyes and yes. turning a knob. Uh, and I still apply that to digital. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, someone once told me that because uh, I still use control surfaces, you know, because I want that analog fader feel. But part of the reason I do it, someone once told me, when you're getting close to the end of your mix, let's say you've done edits um, and you're looking at the wave from the screen, turn off, turn off your computer monitor. Yeah, and just and the science behind it, because when you um, you know, it's, it's like how, uh, uh, like how being blind improves your, your sense of, uh, hearing yeah. or smell. Yeah. That's a great um, analogy actually. Yeah. Cause it, it does that from you. If you think about it, modern mixing or even tracking is so dependent on looking at those waveforms and even more so looking at faders. If you're having to move a mouse to move it, you're, you're dividing your senses. Uh, I find that I get ear fatigue much faster in the digital world than I do in the analog. Yes. And I put that to the test. I fortunately have a couple of friends that still run analog places, and I've I've tried that, and it's true. You're dividing your time, plus your eyes start to hurt from the screen, and um, yes, yeah, so I'll do that a lot. Like I'll go into the studio, say the next day with fresh ears, and just turn the monitors off. Like the screens and then just start listening and i hear so much more than is in my notes of what i want to look at right um, so, so handy tip kids <laughs> get away from the screens right <laughs> there's actually and it's cool that you say this too because there's actually a really cool i don't know if you've ever heard of audio thing plugins they're doing a lot of mm-hmm. innovative stuff that a lot of other plugin companies are not doing and they actually got in cahoots, I believe it was a Sylvia Massey, and they created what's called the blindfold EQ. And it literally has your three bands, but it removes all of the numbers off of there. So you're turning knobs, oh, cool. but you don't have specific numbers to shoot for. You literally have to use your ears and it's free. So if you'd like that, I'll, I'll send oh, that over. That's great. Please. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I love, I love that concept. Um, and because it, it is very much, um, 
yeah, I, I feel like, I mean, I know I, I learn a lot this way, um, but I'm fairly sure that there's a lot of like really famous engineers from back in the day that, that really did the same thing because of, uh, you know, trial and error and necessity. And we're going right. to get to some of that um, as, a, as a general theme. But, you know, I, I would play around with gear that I had like, no idea how it worked. I remember when I got my first API lunchbox, which I found at a garage sale, I'm probably 20 bucks in Woodstock, New York. <laughs> and I was really used to like MCI consoles and that kind of EQ system um, and some, you know, some knee, older Neve stuff. Not that it was that old at the time, but I got the API lunchbox and the the whole EQ system was pretty foreign to me. But everyone was like, oh, like the 558s just sound incredible. And yeah, the signal sounded great through them. But I didn't really know how they worked. So I just closed my eyes and started turning knobs. Um, and I still don't really know how they work <laughs> with those guys. I mean, I, like I go and someone see if they've got them or they've got a plug in. I'm just like, oh, I know that setting works for this pr as a starting point. Right. Um, but that's, uh, but I feel like people must have done that, say back in like the, the 60s or 70s, because there was always someone coming out with a new piece of gear. Uh, you know, like that they were laying on someone and they, were, they just had to try it on a session. Uh, because it was so like, balls to the wall, you know, time was a was a thing uh, that must have happened. I'm sure there was certain like mad geniuses with crazy ears, like Jeff Emmerich, who really was like, "Oh yeah, I, I, you know, this frequency is like oh, so clean compared to this and blah blah blah." But I'm sure there were a lot of those people, especially at places like you know Sun Studios, uh, where they were like really flying by the seat of their pants. That would, get some gear in and just be like, oh, that sounds good on Elvis's voice. Just run with that. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> turn a knob and you know. Right. And, or places like Motown that didn't even have a bunch of EQs where they would they would use the room, which is what everyone should do. Move the mic around. Yeah. Move the singer around. That changes the EQ or the compression. Mm -hmm. uh, put a blanket over something. There's a compressor. Yeah, I just really um it's crazy that you're saying this. Right before this interview, I got an email. But yeah, the guy reached out yeah. and he said um, that he had watched the Billie Jean video and that I, in the video, I had said a couple things about that kick drum sound. And here it is. Arthur, Arthur Noxon is the, is the man's name. Okay. And he actually worked with Bruce Sweeting to invent the, uh, the cover that goes over the kick drum. It's like a skin that goes over the kick drum. And he told me the whole process of how they actually got that sound. He says they added a concrete block wrapped in a moving blanket to weight the drum down. And then they added this drum cover. You then wrap the edges with a, a drawstring, snug down the front of a cover, unzip it, stick a dynamic mic into the drum shell, and zip it back up. Then to add sizzle at the top of it, they put a rider. <laughs> To put I sizzle it. into it, they put a rider symbol on the top of that so that every time he would hit the kick, that rider symbol would be rattling on the top of that. And he said the front skin is covered. It just gives it like a little bit of a snap. Yeah, yeah. I was like, that is so cool. So he was, he's got a picture here of Bruce Sweeting using some of their products. And um, yeah, immediately after I read the email, I was like, I am reaching back out to this guy. I want to know more about this. So, but. To your point, I mean, you know, that's where this experimentation stuff would happen all of the time because everybody at that point in time was, they really wanted to get that unique sound. And it seems like the yeah. different differentiation from then till now is almost like everybody almost wants to sound the same. It's so true. And everyone's copying someone else or sampling someone else or, um, you know, I mean, that's that's always been my huge issue with, with the, the sample discussion going way back. It was mm -hmm. like, okay, you know, it's like, and I, I disagreed with the, uh, the copyright ruling on, on that 
the, the whole eight bar thing because there's a lot that you can do with eight bars if, if something is very innovative. Um, but the funky drummer group from the uh, the James Brown records is obviously the iconic example, and most people don't really, <clears throat> especially nowadays when everyone thinks that art is free or stealable. Mm -hmm. um, people don't have any understanding of how much time and effort went in to creating those drum sounds at a time when gear didn't exist and it did rely on um, uh, what you had available and the studios became unique for their sound and, and a, a, a change of scenery and, and the kind of gear they had. Um, you go back to... Uh, when things were more bare bones, you go back to the 60s as a, a great example, late 60s particularly, <clears throat> when there was more technology and, and you know, four tracks had evolved into eight tracks, and 16 was coming and blah, blah, blah. You know, Sears had a very definitive sound. Um, and that continued right through, you know, like most of the 80s, um, which is why some would be like, oh, I want to go to... to Trident Studios or Abbey Road or Criteria in, in Florida, right. uh, which was, you know, and, and that's a great story. I mean, uh, you know, people went, Criteria really involved because um, I believe Atlantic Records had a deal with them and, you know, Robert Stigwood, who we'll get to, had a deal with Atlantic, but people like Arif Martin and Tom Dowd working out of criteria and people started going there from the UK for a change of scenery, some sunshine, you know, Clapton went there and did, uh, um, and did Layla. Uh, first of all, it wasn't London in, in uh, September, October uh, of that year, which, which it was because uh, um, I know that because the record was done in like 10 days and, um, Little Wing, the Hendrix cover is on that record, which was done because Hendrix died while they were making that record. Um, and they just fit the Dominoes as a back, backup band had just finished uh, uh, playing with George Harrison for All Things Must Pass in London. So they went to Florida. But a big part of, of Clapton's thing with that is that he spent some time in the American South. You know, he played with Delaney and Barney, and loved what the Allman Brothers were doing. And Tom Dowd had worked with the Allman Brothers and knew him from the Cream days. So going to Florida and being in the American South was, uh, he felt would be part of his sound. Because they'd actually done demos with Phil Spector for the, what would become the later record in London after doing uh, the Harrison record. And that was part of the deal. It's like, well, Dominoes would be the backup band and then Spectre would produce what was going to be the Layla record. And it was apparently just too Phil Spectre-y. Like, you know, he'd written those songs and done these blues covers to be more authentic, uh, more raw. And so he went to Florida. But that was sort of really the birth of the modern criteria and the idea that everything had a sound, you know, so sound in, in LA. A record plant, all of these places, and um, Trident Studios had a sound in London. I think a lot of the Bowie stuff was done there because it had a Trident console. It had it didn't have the Neve stuff from or um, EMI stuff from like Abbey Road. It had different ceilings, it had different things, and um, room acoustics were key. Um, going back to your like Billy Jean thing those gear didn't exist in abundance the way it does now. Um, now everything's a plug-in if you want it to be, but you know, there were sounds that you, by the time you got sort of deep into the eighties and people say we wanted to get that Billy Jean type of snare, uh, they could recreate it with gates and this and that things that were not readily available. It just didn't sound like it. Um, Digital reverb became a real thing in the 80s. Uh, so you started creating more artificial soundscapes, which, which was cool because they didn't sound real. You know, that's 
you you start listening to to find the ache. You start listening to people that really push that crap to the limit. Uh, Phil Collins, uh, Prince, <laughs> you know, digital yeah. delays, digital reverbs that didn't sound like real rooms. They, they were on magic space. Bowie, yeah. you know. Right. <laughs> um, and even though they were marketed originally to uh, to sound re- like real spaces, and people were like, nah, I know they don't, but let's have fun with it. <laughs> right. Uh, so, cor- phases and choruses. So you, um, we just talked a little bit about the Billie Jean aspect of things and some of the, the craziness that went into, uh, it was just really innovative thinking, honestly, that just got them to that point where they were at. And it was during this whole time of these videos coming out and the channel starting to literally blow up that you somehow stumbled across the staying alive reaction video where I did sort of the breakdown of that and the, and I, I I hate to call them reaction videos, but but that's sort of the the terminology of the day, but they're more like production breakdown videos. I think they're more like analysis videos, which is what I call them in my VIP membership. I actually call them analysis videos. So what was your first, like when you stumbled across that video, what was your first inclination? Like, what did you, what come to mind? Um, Well, first of all, I think you're, I think there was, I think the reaction title is the is the, the best you can do to attract an audience because it, I think you'd run into a couple of issues if you're if it was called what it should be, which is what the actual <laughs> would be the because <laughs> uh, you know because that that's that is the thing and it doesn't get old. You know, I had. Um, a the luxury years ago um i was doing some recording in la and i was visiting a uh a friend who had a studio in venice beach um uh, amazing guy um uh wish we were still in touch actually david bearwald is his name and he was part of david and david welcome to the boomtown big hit for but then he wrote, um, he was part of the Tuesday Night Music Club. He co-wrote like all of that show of pro stuff. Um, and yeah, just a uh, fantastic guy, mad genius. Um, and he had a little studio in Venice that was just gorgeous. And he had, um, I don't know how he got them, but you know, things like this were around back then, but he had a, a, a copy of, uh, master tapes of, of uh, not ma- of like multi-track tapes of Marvin Gaye's What's Going On. Uh, wow. So we were actually able to pull up some stuff from that. Uh, you know, iconic stuff that we were just like mind blown in the way that you're doing with your channel, where you could hear uh, unprocessed things, and in, in many ways, as you know, um, things didn't really sound that different. Uh, with process because right. they were recorded to tape the way you wanted it to sound. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, think about back in the day, way back in the day, you know, you, you wanted people to build, you know, a reverb chamber or something, or they just put, say, a drum kit in a room that sounded that way, and it would go to tape like that, um, especially if it was a live band. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of that Zeppelin stuff. Exactly. You know, that was a great example. Um, so, yeah, I had watched your, um, I had stumbled across your Billy Jean thing, which is a song that I know like a lot about in terms of its background and, um, uh, and boarding process and sort of influences of and, um, the mix process. So I know a lot of trivia about that song. Um, I didn't know, I didn't know the specifics of the drum thing you were telling me about, but I knew that they use, I did know that they use like a lot of manual dampening and manipulation, which was pretty normal for, um, which we'll get to with Staying Alive because it's a very similar concept. 
Um, so I stumbled across that and I just thought it was really cool. Um, and I, I loved the way you approached it. And I was working on some other stuff. It's really late. I don't sleep much. And because I think I'd subscribed to your channel after the Billie Jean thing, or maybe I hadn't yet, but YouTube, you know, still throws at you based on what you've seen before. Right. Um, and my feed looks crazy uh, because of <laughs> late night things. It's, you know, it's audio, it's cameras, it's something else that I'm researching right. or it's a, a live Same. performance that I want to see. And then I get fed, you know, the most random crap um so that popped up like i don't know relatively speaking almost immediately like within a couple of days that popped up and i'm like oh okay this is going to be interesting because my first thought was um like i wonder which version he has because i'm bet he doesn't have do will get to i bet he doesn't have the actual tracks uh and you didn't <laughs> so uh, you you know you well you had what they mixed uh but not what came before and you had told me a story on the phone and I'll, I'll go back into it here I, I had the chance to listen to all of that stuff and help remix that song um you know back when i was a kid uh for something which i'll get to and i'd heard all of that stuff that you that you had like you had exactly what what I got to hear on the multi-tracks. Um, and so I'm lit because I know so much about that song. Uh, I'm basically, and because I've seen your Billie Jean, I've seen your personality, I've seen your, your reaction to stuff and how you're breaking things down and then rewinding it because you're like, huh, what? <laughs> yeah, you know, like, and, um, so I'm already thinking in advance, I'm like, okay, he's going to play this back and he's either going to talk about how he doesn't understand what's going on technically or, and it doesn't make sense or, or it's, there's at least going to be that look on his face where he's like, okay, like, how did that happen? Right. <laughs> um, and there was. Like yes. I could see the wheels turning. And after that, I was like, you know, I've got to reach out to this guy because he's that enthusiastic about it. And he's obviously like knows enough to like be baffled by certain things. Um, even if he didn't vocalize it on the channel at the time. And so, yeah, that's, that's part of why I reached out. I was like, all right, I know this guy wants to know trivia. Yes, absolutely. It's a, confu it's absolutely. a confusing mix. There was a lot that was going on and, and still, I went back and listened to him again uh, the other day and before this interview. And I was like, it, it, a lot of it just doesn't make sense in the, at least in the time and era that that was recorded, because if it was recorded, you know, today I'd be like, oh yeah, that makes total sense. You know, they double tracked, they did this, they did, they had an infinite amount of tracks. There's no way, you know, that, but back then I'm like, they only had like at that given time, what was it like eight tracks at the most that they could work with? Uh, no, they had they were, um, uh, their 24 uh, trap machine, their two inch uh, 24 track at that point. Oh, okay. Um, okay. But, but what you're listening to is somewhere along the lines of uh, a 96 or more trap mix. And that's where, like, especially the vocals, uh, that's where I was really getting baffled because mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, so there's three tracks of harmony vocals each one of them have three different singers and i'm assuming it's all of the brothers the gib brothers yeah and then mm -hmm. i'm like okay but it how i mean i i can understand the concept of everyone gather around a microphone let's record onto one track i get that but it still there's like some stuff that's going on there that can you break that down can you kind of sort of unpack for those of us who weren't oh, there yeah and there's a lot of this ties in with the whole like sort of necessity, mother of invention uh, stuff. Um, and, you know, and the fact that a lot of people behind the scenes or even the artists themselves didn't get the credit that they really deserve for, for being producers. Uh, you know, there's my, the three brothers are one of the most successful producers of all time. Um, my uncle Barry, I know for a long time was like, 
the most successful producer of all time because he worked on other projects outside of that. And he was very, uh, uh, along with Albert Gallup and Carl Richardson, I mean, he produced, um, you know, uh, his brother Andy's stuff and uh, the Barbara Streisand guilty work, uh, which does tie in because the song Woman in Love ties in with Stan Live and those drums. Um, but so much stuff was going on behind the scenes. Uh, but people viewed the Bee Gees as songwriters, they viewed them as singers. Um, and, you know, there wasn't a lot of credit back then uh, for, for production and even engineering. You didn't get, you know, there wasn't, it was very much an industry. There was no internet, no cell phones. There wasn't even magazines. You know, the Entertainment Tonight didn't even exist until the late 80s. Uh, no one covered anything like that. Mix magazine, recording, all of those things came, you know, much later. Uh, credits on a recording were, you know, just industry inside information that was printed on a record. Um, so um, the first thing you, that you need to know about uh, the three brothers, um, they started singing as little kids together for those that didn't know. And for those in the U.S. who are really mostly familiar with the 70s stuff, forget that they were actually really huge in the 60s as, as kids. But their sound was different, um, even though it was coming from a lot of the same roots. Um, a lot of people just didn't understand that these were the same guys later on. The dude did jive talking were the same guys that did to love them a few years before and and you know that made a lot of sense especially especially because the heavily r&b uh fused stuff from the mid to late 70s um was uh, initially really really hugely popular with black audiences and mm -hmm. who were not familiar who, who gave it a cult following before it became like mainstream uh, didn't care that they were white. Some of them didn't even know that they were white, but weren't familiar with the more folky psychedelic stuff from sounding stuff from the 60s, uh, but also didn't join dots. Like they knew the songs that they'd written, you know, like they weren't, like they knew, say, maybe like Nina Simone's To Love Somebody, but not the original Bee Gees version. Um, <laughs> like To Love Somebody was written for Otis Redding. Uh, and Otis Redding uh, loved it, wanted to record it, but he he went on tour and died before he got a chance to. So the brothers did it themselves. That was a major step for them uh, in, in what became their own career because they may have ended up just being writers if that had been it. Uh, and it did. It, for a long time, it was the most covered song of all time. Uh, maybe it still is. I don't know. Um, but they started singing as little kids. They had this creepy ability to like one voice if they needed to. And singing around one microphone was something they'd always done because that's all there was as little kids in, in you know, Australia um, or playing at a club as literally little kids with often no microphones. You know, that's just like, yeah, uh, Barry with an acoustic guitar and then like, you know, the little twins just together. Um, <clears throat> and they'd use spatial distancing to create sound. So by the time you get to a lot more technology later on, that's where they were the most comfortable. Um, and when it came to multi-tracking, what they would do, just like uh, you sort of suggested or guessed was do layers of the three of them around a microphone, but say maybe with um, the harmonies or even leads, because they could sound like each other. The other thing you, everyone should remember is whenever you hear a, a track, let's say on one of your, uh, on the Staying Alive, you pull up one of those background vocal harmonies, that's all three of them. Uh, it might sound like one thing, but oftentimes it's actually like uh, quadruple track. 
So it sounds still sounds like one, but it's a little bit thicker. They were so tight, uh, not just with each other, but with themselves as a unit, that all you got was like a slight chorusing effect. You know, as if I double trap myself, you know, if I triple or quadruple it, it just starts to become this a very sort of lush mess. They would do it for like precision. Um, and without it sounding like a flanger or a phaser or uh, a slapback delay from two tape machines that a lot of other people were doing, but it didn't sound right. Right. Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, they would start layering things with, say, one voice more prominent on the microphone. Um, and uh, to pad that out with a different sonic texture. Uh, and then maybe one, uh, one or two of the brothers would go in and do, say, a solo take of the same thing, so it could be not knocked down depending on who you wanted to be more dominant. A lot of songs were uh, dual lead vocals, uh, usually between like Barry and my dad that would sound like one voice. Um, How Deep Is Your Love is a good example of that. Um, like they would both, they would just mesh to make it sound like one. So, so it just sounds slightly different from a lead on another song. Right, or, right. Um, and so that, that's sort of really the first thing to know is that that's, they felt very comfortable with that and they were incredibly tight with each other. So building up those layers um, was uh, with a dominant voice in there it was all just done with spacing away from a, from the mic. That, that's the first part. The next part would have to be, if this is where you want to go next, is to sort of trivia and basic construction of that song and why what you've got to listen to is uh, so weird. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Let's unpack that. And for those, those of you that are watching this, um, We've just talked about the three brothers, but he hasn't explic explicitly said who his dad was. But your dad was actually Robin of the three, right? Yeah. Yes. That's correct. Yes. So when he's talking about this stuff, he's not just shooting from the hip. Like he's got, he's got the info. So yes, peel back those layers of the onion. Tell us about why, why is all this weirdness happening? I need to know. Yeah, a little bit of backstory there. And for people who are watching this that, that want to know, say more about like the, the brothers in general, and also touch on a little bit of this stuff because there's some, you know, Albert Gluten actually gets to talk to me of the stuff that, that I'm going to bring up. Uh, the HBO documentary, How Can You Mend a Broken Heart, that came out uh, a few months back. It was huge. Frank Marshall did is a, a fantastic documentary. Um, uh, it, it's so good that halfway through I forgot it was about my family. Like it has such oh, wow. a, a incredible narrative to it. Um, so yeah, it's called How Can You Mend a Broken Heart? Uh, go do that. Um, there's also uh, a book series um, that the first part came out last year. It's called Decades. Um, and actually, you'll, Robert, you'll absolutely love this. Um, and uh, I could actually, uh, um, I could get a a copy sent to you, uh, actually from uh, from one of the writers. Uh, but it's a uh, it's a book uh, it's a book series called Decades that uh, about the brothers that is um, specifically for people um, who love the kind of shit we're talking about and what it is. The, the sometime in the next two or three months, the seventies version is coming out. One that came out last year is all about. Uh, the Bee Gees in the 60s. But what the, what the book does for the first time ever is break down every single song, backstory behind it, what happened in the studio, how it was recorded, how um, wow. who was involved. Uh, and it's done in this very cool narrative way. Um, and and it's great. It's, a, it's really great for engineers and producers uh, and, and writers, especially the 60s stuff is great because it, it really focuses a lot on the lack of technology um, and it uses, you know, these guys as a, a way to sort of explain what everyone was dealing with. Uh, so, you, you know, so you, in certain areas, you can plug anyone into that 
category, you know, and Hendrix and Eddie Kramer, you know, the Beatles, you know, you name it, that um, try and release material as fast as possible and try to come up with new sounds and uh, sort of compete with each other to be innovative, right. um, which is something my dad used to talk about a lot. And, and that mentality carried over into the 70s, particularly for, for the brothers. Um, and what they were doing became really innovative. But this, yeah, but that book series uh, covers that the 70s version or edition, uh, part two is coming out uh, soon. Um, I got to write the forward for the book and I'm actually in the middle of writing the forward, one of the forwards for the second, uh, which is cool, it's a fun experience. But yeah, it's great. It's totally something everyone should, should check out. Um, and it's just written in this great way that makes you want to read another book. And the 70s one is going to be great because this technology got better and better. The brothers became the biggest artists in the world. And what, a lot of what they did set the stage for stuff to come. Um, but so some of the background of Staying Alive is touched on in the HBO documentary and will be sort of more in-depthly touched on in that book. Uh, but... <clears throat> They, this song has covers a lot of like necessity. Um, the project was uh, coming off a, a huge record before the, the sessions for this song, for, for the, what became the songs that were on Sad My Fever were, were originally just supposed to be um, songs for their next record. And then Robert Stigwood had called and said I need songs for this movie like that and so all of that was incredibly sort of circumstantial and accidental it wasn't um, uh, the two things weren't coinciding it wasn't like the uh, they were writing songs for this movie they had no idea about the movie Robert was doing that on the side and uh, then it all kind of came together and they were in France uh, the Chateau de Reveal which is you know Bunch of people have recorded there. Alvin John had done a bunch of stuff there, and um, uh, it was so. Essentially, they started out like doing demos, but also tracking and coming off of the previous record. They were tracking very fast, and they were doing a lot of live stuff, um, and doing a lot of writing, staying up like twenty four hours a day, and doing a lot of writing. And then the whole band was there tracking, you know, kind of immediately. Um, but also, like you know, the, I, I know that there was kind of a demo mentality going into it before sort of deadlines started really hitting. Um, and in fact, I mean, a little sidebar: there are more. There are songs that never got finished from that session that were in a, a rougher form that weren't mixed that uh, would have been on their next studio album uh, after the Children of the World record that didn't make, that their versions of didn't make it onto the Sad Night Fever soundtrack because there essentially wasn't time. But those songs were, uh, were still there because they got covered by other artists who were tracking them while they, so they were sending stock songs off that weren't gonna get, if I can't have you, the even element made a huge hit with, was on there and More Than A Woman, which ended up having both of their versions of the soundtrack, uh, the Tavares version and theirs. I guess they were able to squeeze that mix out in time <laughs> for the deadline um but with uh but there was this um, they were on such a roll with the previous two records and the production team of the brothers and uh albert Galut and carl richardson were um, they were just on a roll and the creativity was just like non-stop uh, and they were just chugging through and chugging through and they'd written staying alive and um, we'll come back to the writing part. You brought something up on the phone with me, uh, but you touch on it. It's one of the things I wanted to talk to you about when you were soloing tracks. Uh, but we'll come back to that. Just remind me about the acoustic guitar. There's oh, a okay. there's fun yeah. trivia there. Um, and so they've written the song. And they were they were trying to cut it. Uh, and Dennis, the drummer, uh, had 
you know, for a long time, uh, I thought the reason he wasn't there was because he'd actually, um, the, he was sick, he had uh, flu or something like that, but that actually wasn't true. His mother got sick. And um, I think she passed away during that time, but he had to leave. Um, and uh, for, for and handle that. So again, you know, you've got this a living at this studio in Paris, and they're writing and tracking and writing and tracking, and it's all just like nonstop. And Stan and Live have come up, but they didn't have a drummer. But they wanted to get the idea down. They wanted to get the um, the concept down before it went bye bye. And everyone else in the band was there, so. Uh, Albie Galuton uh, came up with this. Uh, and I've always known about this and you know, chatted with multiple people about it, but uh, he describes it for, sort of for the first time more in depth in, in that, in the HBO movie. Uh, in order to keep working, uh, he took a piece of tape that had drums from a different song that they'd already tracked. Uh, just the kick, the snare, and the hat. Uh, took a small piece of tape, or like recorded those things down to a piece of tape, and ran the tape in a loop all the way around the room. Just rolling and rolling and rolling uh, as, as a loop in perfect time at the tempo that they wanted by just sort of shifting the pitch and um, slowing it up or speeding it down. Uh, so they jammed that, and it just—it was. It just—it was one of the first ever tape loops, maybe the maybe the first. That I mean, that concept existed in like mellotrons and things like that back in back in the sixties. But this was literally like a fat reel of tape going around the room, <laughs> uh, like crazy mad genius stuff at probably four in the morning. Um, and that—that's the kick, the snare, and the hat. And so they created this drummer. So they jammed to it and they started laying tracks down and the tracks sort of became like cooler and cooler, more final. And so the idea from what I've heard is, uh, okay, well, when Dennis comes back, we'll cut the drums, well, after the fact, because uh, they've, got, they've got a bass line down they've got this loop that Albie had cut sort of to be, you know, tempo perfect. So essentially Dennis would have a click track to play to if he came back. So not a big deal. Um, so to wrap up the drum thing, Dennis does come, but they basically finished the song for the most part. Dennis comes back, uh, listens to it, loves the loop, and, um, and suggests uh, playing uh, fills on top of it um, and and some percussion so uh, and there's probably more to this than than I'm saying but and it just kind of makes it so unique and it gives us this sort of like slightly sort of like funky Latin flavor but Dennis um, chose to play uh, either either was his idea or it was it was you know, Carl or Albie or, or, or one of the brothers, but instead of playing uh, like traditional fills, um, he chose to play the timbales over it as the fills and cymbals. And that's, which is a genius concept because if you, um, if you think about how a drummer plays, uh, there are things going on with the kick drum and to that matter, the snare, when, when you play a fill, when you play a tom fill, that coincide with each other, because a drummer only has a certain number of hands and feet. Right. So uh, you can, so it'd be very unnatural for him to like play some toms over a very methodic, like kick and snare, whereas uh, timbales and cymbals feel like a percussionist in the same room as a drummer just playing right, a straight yeah. groove uh, is more natural not to mention in mixing if you want those to shine more um 
muting the kick and snare in the hat feels natural. It's something that a drummer would do if they were working with a percussionist. You know, you, you see that a lot uh, later on with, um, if you go look at, uh, okay, let's go down a YouTube rabbit hole um, of live stuff with um, uh, Prince and Sheila E, mm. where, yeah. where there's a drummer and she's playing percussion. She's just standing up and she's got a whole percussion rig. Uh, the dynamic between the drums and the percussion is, um, is very mapped out either in rehearsals or they've just got this sort of uh, dynamic where they can look at each other. It's like, it's your turn, it's my turn. So like, he'll basically just stop playing and it should be like, and then it's like, he's back in and she's there with <laughs> some symbols or some accents, right? right. It's all very, very natural, like it's one person. Um, so anyway, it was a genius idea. Um, and that's what happened. But uh, taking the sort of bigger picture a step further and explaining uh, your uh, huh? issues with, <laughs> with listening to the tracks is because the brothers were always trying to get smoother and cleaner vocals and basically, and because that was their jam and being very limited by uh, the now 24 track technology. I'm really, I don't know, understand how they made it through the 60s as teenagers uh, without, um, without just sort of their brains exploding because four track, eight track technology must have been so limiting for these poor <laughs> <laughs> But because um, 24 tracks were but they always wanted lusher and more layers and they hadn't advantage that other people didn't, which was their, their vocals and how sort of creamy that was. Um, huge influence on, on, let's say, Jackson in the 80s. Like, all right, how do I match that? How do I, I don't have these brothers. Um, and, and he didn't with the, with the Jacksons. Like, they didn't have that vocal dynamic of brothers. Uh, so Jackson kind of became his own trio and really focused and rehearsed incredibly hard on those like subtle layers of harmony and double tracks that you hear on songs like Billie Jean, which is very obviously and not, it's not a coincidence that Billie Jean kind of sounds like the sequel to Staying Alive. It's something that he very much wanted to you know, emulate uh, a funky song in a minor key, very similar tempo and drum groove, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you go and listen to Jackson's demo of it which uh is floating around which i'm sure you've heard probably even have a mm -hmm. thing on your channel um but <clears throat> uh it's um and there are like a lot more similarities to it that would have been familiar only a few years after staying alive to audiences um uh you know there's there's not a huge difference from that whole like really genius that man loved it ah. <laughs> there's a very right. clever um, and when you bring the harmonies in when you bring them out and um and his ad-libs are in my opinion his own version of what barry's ad-libs are doing in staying alive when mm -hmm. it comes to filling in those gaps like musically um jackson took his to a more percussive level but it became a trademark of his you know his his whoops and his he he's became a, a thing, you know, that getting back on subject, the brothers were always trying to layer more vocals um, and create more of a lush, a lush thing. Billie Jean is a great example of this. Staying Alive is a great example of this. Any records that are beautifully uh, produced have this. And one of the things I really dug about your, your channel and the, the two of the, three of the things that you allude to like with those two songs and and some others that i've seen since uh and you don't say it directly like this which is cool uh it's just like you point people to it it's and not a lot of people do it today it's how important arrangement was um yes it was so it was so you you couldn't first of all you couldn't throw the kitchen sink at something back then because you were limited with tracks, which made you think about things more delicately. But also, uh, arrangement is so much about being aware of frequencies, like what's stepping on something else. 
so aware of, of um, too many things getting in the way of stuff. Um, what's the most important instrument here? Is you know, is it is it the voice or is it the guitar? And so you you in a, in a lot of records that that you can break down the individual tracks on you. It's not just a case of something someone writing a fader in a in a gap to bring up a guitar or a, a synth or, or even an, a vocal ad lib. If you listen to the tracks, they were recorded that way a lot. Like you listen to "Staying Alive" is a great example. You listen to that. that sort of guitar part um, that's pretty iconic, you know, the actual, the opening riff. Um, if you ask someone uh, who's familiar with that song, this question uh, about where does that guitar come in and leave, most people would tell you it, it plays all the way through the song. It doesn't, it stops and starts. Like, right. that, you know, Billie Jean does really similar things. You know, that, that synth stuff, just actually just stops. You don't notice it because the hole is filled by say a, a background vocal harmony pad, mm -hmm. which is filling up the same frequency line. So they don't need to be there together. It's just becomes messy. Um, so arrangement was like so key, which is why these songs, when you break them down the way you have, are a lot more sparse than you think they are. Right, right. Uh, but when you put them together, they create this, this tapestry. And uh, that that is so so important. Like just uh, stopping, you know. And yeah. W when do you and letting something else breathe? And you know, I've even touched and on that in the sense of sort of um, likening it to like the ocean, how the ocean will ebb and flow. Yeah. And I think good music should have this an emotional ebb and flow where it lead takes you on this journey. Staying alive yet again, another great great example of this billy jean um i just am finishing up right now a reaction to probably one of the best climaxes of a song which was Freebird by leonard skinnard when they get to that climax oh, yeah. at the end but it takes you on this journey there's this ebb in the flow uh the verse the first verse leads you into it's sort of like the waves are coming in it's introducing you to the ocean of possibilities and then it starts yeah. to come back out and then the next ebb comes in and now you're at the chorus you're seeing more of what mm. the ocean has to offer and then it comes back out and then all of a sudden you get to yeah. this huge crashing wave of this crescendo and it's like i'm in the ocean and i think when music can do that in such a way as this song did staying alive yet like you, much to your point i mean this has these elements that are just dropping out and then other things are coming in and it's like there's never any loss of excitement even though the drum yeah. loop in and of itself is literally a loop. You don't lose interest. And it takes like a yeah. really brilliant mind to put that all together and not lose interest. So kudos to them and, and Albie Gluten and, and the, the three brothers who put this all together and said, you know what, let's just make a banger because <laughs> that's what they did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's, um, you know, it is, it is very, um, uh, yeah, and the first of all, they were on a roll, but then there's also, you know, and they were in incredibly tight live band at that point too. So, you know, um, fleshing things out in the studio, we almost sort of got to a point of, okay, this is how it should sound. And, you know, you're still rolling tape the whole time, but, you know, in terms of arrangements, uh, that's one of the things I miss about, like actually being in like a band band, uh, is as opposed to like say working with people who play with me as a solo artist is when we work things out in rehearsal arrangement would come literally by itself right uh, because you you get this psychic connection with each other but also it's very easy to be like nah dude just stop playing there like no <laughs> you know <laughs> like <laughs> you're stepping um, on my bass you're stepping on my guitar work you're yeah yeah, I, I get yeah. that. Yeah, and you, and I, I almost encourage anyone um, who's just getting started, if you're really young, uh, play in a band and do that. Uh, yes, because you do you do learn those those kinds of things much more than you do, say, with session work or, or playing with yourself. Like, um, 
you know, people who've got like a heavy piano background almost undoubtedly will go into a band or a session environment uh, playing with too much left hand. Uh, because as a pianist, that's what you do. You're filling out those bass tones and extra movement, but that's covered by other people in the band. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not really your job anymore. Um, you know, you'll notice that like when you, you know, some of those genius keyboard players of all time, you know, go pull up those raw tracks and so you've got plenty at this point in, in your, uh, in your arsenal, you especially piano, you listen to that and solo it. It doesn't sound that great. It's really tinny. It's got to cut through the mix. Right. And it's usually very, sim very simple. It's upper mid and high sprinkles or solid pads um, that often don't even involve the left hand at all unless that's what is driving it. Uh, like, or if you were like, a, say, a Fats Domino or an Elton John, where, again, arrangement, the producer is telling you or knowing that because you're Elton John, part of your shtick is a, is a pianist, Billy Joel. So vocal, song, piano, these are um, the essence of the artist, right? Mm -hmm. So guess what? Someone's going to write a really simple bass line right. around if, if Elton or, or Billy Joel has already written something heavy-handed on the left side. Because that dominates, that becomes that's part of their style. Right. So if you're filling out, so the bassist is just going to sit back, make plot along on root notes, um, compliment. You know? mm, key so word it's, right so there, compliment. I like that. That's exactly yeah. what it is. That's that's totally what it is. And again, maybe even some of those records more than likely stop playing in a way that you wouldn't notice. Like you're playing a bass part. But then you don't notice it drop out because that's where Billy Joel is filling in the gaps with his left hand. It just goes like so low and he's stretching out that, you know, it's not, not important. Um, uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, frequency, space, all those things. But with, with Stan Alive, again, they were layering um, stuff. And this wasn't the first song that they'd done this with, but the, um, in order to create more takes, um, they came up with the idea of slave machines. And I, I want to say that it was Albie and those guys that came up with it, but I don't know if that's true. I don't know if it was maybe Tom Dowd or someone else from that crew, uh, and that criteria-based crew that had come up with it first, because Tom Dowd came up with some nutty stuff. I mean, um, uh, Depending on who you talk to, it's either him or Les Paul that invented the four trap machine in the first place. <laughs> uh, and I think it was Tom, just because Arif Mardin told me that story when Tom was was assisting under Arif and teching under him when they were doing like um, uh, Aretha Franklin records and stuff like that. Uh, I don't know enough about the Les Paul story, but uh, people credit him with it too. Um, but there again, a lot of stuff happened at the same time in those days, out of necessity, right? Uh, in different parts of the world. So, um, I now, don't know if I'll be. Now, one element of of the mix that I would like to to circle back around to as a guitarist, I got to know. And <laughs> you were talking about these layers and you know complementing things. One of the tracks that I feel like as soon as I soloed it, it blew my mind because I realized just how much of an integral role it was playing in saying live, but I never really heard it until I soloed it. And it was the acoustic guitar that was that, it has like this chugging, like chick -a -chick -a -chick -a -chick -a -chick. Like, can you, who was playing that? What were they playing on? Can you elaborate on that a little? Yep, I, I can. Um, and, yeah, and I'll, you know, I'll go into that and then remind me about the whole slave machine thing to finish oh, yeah, that up. Yeah. It, it actually because it ties in um, not just with how weird that the mix you played is, but uh, ties in with all of this stuff um, and and where things went in recording in general uh, and the, the weird drum track. But yeah, with the guitars, um, 
again, the mix wise, very much about arrangement um, and subtle rhythmical things that um, that you don't necessarily notice, or musical things that you don't really notice. You'll you'll hear it in some of the vocals, which I think you pointed out, very instrument like, as opposed to yes. it, like they're doing musical things that are part of the arrangement. Um, you know, again, you hear a lot of that stuff from Billy Jean, you know, like in order to create a sound that no one had necessarily done. I, mean, I know people for years that were trying to figure out what patch on a Juno or whatever it was they'd used to create it, but how they got that synth sound in Billie Jean because Jackson sang along with it and padded it up. It's tucked way in the back. <laughs> it's just enough to change the, it almost designed, it wouldn't surprise me if him and Quincy Jones went, yeah, let's just do that so no one can figure out our sound. Because that's what everyone was doing in the 80s. Like, what synth did he use? What this? What, you yeah. know? Um, and so they, they came up with something unique, but um, padding things out. So that acoustic guitar is very tucked in there, but it's a percussive thing by the time you listen to the mix, uh, which again, would have been there when Dennis came back and played percussion on it. So it's all very complimentary. Once you start mixing that acoustic in, um, you know, you're hearing a soft from the, the low mids. That is almost like a synth because it's so rolling, but you're hearing this, percussive thing if you really strain your ears but it's tucked in in a way that gives you padding and motion without you really noticing uh, but it's important because it's a backbone to the Bee Gees music um, they for those who aren't familiar with the 60s stuff some of it sounded very sort of folky and psychedelic some of it uh, even in the early 70s became very sort of uh, country oriented. I mean, uh, Words is a huge song of theirs that tons of country artists cover. Um, you know, how, the, their version of How Could You Mend a Broken Heart uh, that Al Green covered very differently, has more of a country flavor. Uh, they, were, they always wrote R&B stuff, but they were so heavily influenced by like, you know, like the Everly Brothers and, and people who were brothers but also we're doing sort of more like folky stuff. And Barry was very influenced by like Johnny Cash. And you can really hear that with um, the percussive guitar playing, say on Jive Talking. And I've heard stories that, that he was doing the sort of Johnny Cash piece of paper in the, uh, in the strings yeah, yeah. To, to create that. Um, I don't know if that's true, but it wouldn't surprise me knowing Barry. But He's got an incredible pocket. Um, and that's him playing the acoustic guitar. Uh, but here's what's unique about it. And you can chop up this interview and insert uh, this uh, once you go listen to it. Um, first of all, what makes uh, Barry's playing unique is that he uh, plays and writes in open D tuning. He, doesn't, he can't play any other way. Um, that guitar is in open D. Uh, if you go and listen to the drum loop and the acoustic guitar by itself, um, just listen to the tone of the guitar, listen to the rhythm. Stand Alive is a country song. Wow. Just solo it and, wow. and just listen to that chugging. It's a, the chords hardly change, but, but you listen to his rhythm. It's got this, ding, 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 ding. it's got this, it's got this like chugging country flavor. And because of the open tuning, it really fills it out uh, in this like literally open way. Instead of it being muted bar chords, it's all open. Um, and that's the backbone of, uh, of everything they wrote. Um, yeah, I mean, in that know, song, I, is so much so that whenever I soloed the guitar, the bass, and the drums by themselves, I was like, that's a song right there. I mean, that could have been the yeah. song. It could have been an and acoustic that's how, and song. That's, and that's how it started. <laughs> everything they did, everything they started out was acoustic. And it would be, uh, I know my dad would play piano occasionally, but it's, you know, Barry with his open D 
as the basis because that's how they started out as little kids. And he was like three years older than the twins. So he picked up the guitar before anyone else. And then Morris became this like mad scientist, multi-instrumentalist. So he played bass <laughs> on a lot of those records and uh, a lot of the keys. Um, and yeah, played every kind of instrument. So a lot of their writing was done on the fly, like Barry with the open D, but then it would be Barry and Morris with Morris playing in standard tuning, which would complement uh, Barry's uh, open D. And, uh, and my dad sort of like filling in like harmonic holes, like vocally, which I think just, you know, they, they found their pattern, they found their dynamic. Um, I know that my dad not playing instruments in writing sessions helped him come up with melodies. Again, it's kind of, kind of like turning your displays off when you mix. It allowed him to come up melodies against something that Barry was playing that Barry might not have necessarily have thought about because he's busy playing guitar. Right. It's like, you've got this open-mindedness. Um, but yeah, solo bass drums and, and uh, acoustic guitar. That's how they wrote it. Uh, it's, it's an acoustic country song. Everything else becomes window dressing. Uh, but the back, but that's the thing with with the brothers give. That's the backbone of everything is the song, and always this philosophy that a good song is a good song, and as a result, it can be a, a country song, it can be a R and B song, mm -hmm. it can be a pop song, and that's how people used to write. You know, there's a reason why, like the Stax stuff, uh, you know, Aretha, Otis, they call that stuff country blues. Um, as well as R and B, it was so many songs from so many different different people. Um, you know, my family wrote songs for Kenny Rogers. Prince wrote songs for Kenny Rogers. You know, it's like it was all across the board. And going back to the uh, again, like to love somebody has been covered by every genre because a good song is a good song is a good song. Mm -hmm. Here we go. That's that's the point. Um, and so the backbone of staying alive. You know, you change the lyrics, you do whatever, but melodically, it's just a great song. And listening to that acoustic guitar really shows you how it was developed. Um, and they were on this percussive street. Well, and being a lot of the, um, not intricately involved, but being around a lot of different like songwriters guilds, I've always heard sort of the acid test for a good song is if you strip away everything, can you play that song acoustically with just you and acoustic and it still go over well? And this is where, I mean, yet again, they can take all those instrumentation out and just have that acoustic guitar and them singing. And that would have been a hit song. I guarantee it. Yeah. 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 And that's, that's the, um, and that's, that's more obvious, obviously with some people's songs where say the rhythm padding instrument whether that's a piano or a guitar is more present you the kind of song where someone can uh, a guitarist or, or a pianist someone like you or i can listen to it on the radio or uh you know streaming and learn to play it kind of almost immediately mm -hmm. so that's obviously that change that goes here one of the cool things about staying alive as an example when it comes to arrangement is much like sort of orchestral music where the basis of it might be played as like, say, a central triad chords on a piano. But once it goes to cellos and violins, the chords are broken up into individual things and ghost, ghost notes and, and harmonics that create chords that uh, were never actually played by anyone. Um, so it, it's, it implies it with the harmonics or again, someone stopping or starting playing will fool you into thinking that it's a completed line um, because a harmonic is taking over. So a song like, like Staying Alive becomes like, tricky to learn because elements of the chords that were played on that acoustic guitar are now being played by individual instruments, you know, maybe like two notes at the same time on the rows, followed by a little fill, one note riffing on the guitar, the bass is going somewhere else um, within the chord. Uh, and then the vocals, you know, all over the place and you're filling out 
uh, different things and you're adding sixes or nines or whatever it is, depending on the song with background vocals. You don't need an instrument there. You don't need, um, like, you would like you would think with a song like Stay in Alive that there's the orchestral arrangement stuff is naturally there throughout the whole song because when they come in, they're so beautifully written. But no, much like Billie Jean later, those strings are accents. Mm-hmm. But you're fooled into thinking of that because the brothers are singing in the same general register as the as the string pads. So where they stop, the real strings take over. You know, so you've got a did it in, did it in, did it in. But it might as well have been them singing in full setup. It complements the uh, again compliment. Um, so yeah, that acoustic guitar is like. This has been a moment uh, of clarity with Spencer Gibb. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys are wondering about proper arrangement, guys, he just laid it out for you. I mean, literally, and that's where this moment of clarity, I had, I had to do that to you. Sorry. Um, oh, no. <laughs> when someone, when I bring someone on the show and they say something that's just like mind blowing, like I know it's going to help somebody. I call those moments of clarity. So ladies and gentlemen, this has been a moment of clarity from Spencer Gibb. (laughs) Dude, what you just said there though, that was like golden because so many times people are looking to add extra implementations of instruments and they want to try to throw everything they can at, at that mix. And then they get to the mix phase and they're like, I don't understand. I got 75 tracks of pianos. Why is it not doing good? But what you just said, I've literally witnessed it in my own music and mixing other individuals' music that know how to arrange well, where you hear those ghost notes, where you hear those elements of the mix that you didn't even plan on. Happy little accidents that just, wow, where did that come from? That's cool. Okay, well, let's keep it. And it's because all of these other instruments are playing off of one another. They're filling in gaps where the other one may not be. Um, Dude, that's, yeah. That is, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, and it's, it's key. It's, and some of the, I guess, sometimes they're happy accidents. Other times, um, they're unhappy accidents. I mean, there's been plenty of mixes that I've worked on where, and I know there's some people watching this that, that hopefully can relate because it actually means you're doing something right. Um, is, I'll be mixing something that has become kind of dense. We'd say background vocals. I've been doing a lot of orchestral work over the last 10 years um, and learning lots more about that, which has really helped with my knowledge of arrangement. Uh, just get better and better. Uh, but I'll be mixing something, especially if it does have like a band and then orchestra underneath it, which my production partner for orchestra, this guy, Ludek Brissel, a incredible film composer and does uh, orchestration for like rock and pop stuff as well and he does all of my stuff uh, and yeah, he's got a background in, in band stuff as well so he thinks like well, if I play him a song that's mostly complete he's going to write the arrangement around that so some, when things are real dense he's laying back with the orchestra so when we record it it's very complimentary but even then, once you get to mixing and you're enhancing frequencies, uh, sometimes things have to go, especially you've got layers of background vocals, things are starting to get a little muddy once you clean up some stuff with EQ. Uh, but as far as those like ghost harmonic things, there are times when I'll get to like say a last chorus and someone's obviously playing a bad note. Like, so, here I am with God knows how many tracks. And I'm thinking, it's someone in the violin section or the cellos that's screwing up. But it, um, I've got to solo those mics and maybe see what I can like mute for a second. But then I'm, I'm thinking, no, it's like I work with the Czech Philharmonic. They don't fuck up, you know? And we would have heard it there. We're not listening to it when we're there and recording with them. We're just hearing the orchestra. They're hearing the track in the cans, but and Ludet's conducting, but we're hearing the orchestra in the room. We hear a fuck up. We just work. Um, that's our job. 
Right. <laughs> and, and guess what? You know what? It'll, I solo everything. That note's not there. That note got created by random shit from a keyboard combined with a background vocal combined with an orchestra, maybe a, a bass harmonic that's ringing out because someone's holding a long note that you just can't hear when it's solo because it's not clashing with anything, but it's just an overhang. Uh, and you don't, and it might be because Lude Echo I wrote something in the orchestra that complements it when it was unmixed, but you couldn't hear that bass hangover. Um, and you couldn't hear it when you were scoring it, you couldn't hear it when you were recording the orchestra. And once you fine tune the mix and get things to pop, it, it carries over. Um, so it's not the orchestra's fault or the arranger's fault, it's, you know, it's just, usually something in the band, but not intentional or something that totally was, it was just an acoustic track. And you never right. would have heard it because the harmonic wasn't clashing. Um, so, especially if you start to do clever stuff with vocals. Um, you know, one of the, uh, I learned a number of years ago and it, it, it makes uh, them unique compared to other artists at that time, um, because George Martin was an orchestral arranger, one of the things that he taught the Beatles very early on, and they just really scored by, pun not intended, by getting paired up with him as a producer, compared to say other bands that were coming out of like the Liverpool area that were skiffle based also, they sounded very similar. There wasn't a whole lot that made the Beatles completely unique on the club scene, you know, in Hamburg, whatever, they were just a, another live band doing skiffle with good harmonies and, and uh, I loved rock and roll. But, and like most rock and roll bands back then, it was, um, you know, they just played basic, basic triads, three chords, you know what I mean? E-A-G, mm -hmm. boom, 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 you know, sort of very rooted in that kind of Buddy Holly, sort of kind of stuff that you know McCartney talked about a ton in interviews um but as they got deeper and deeper into exploring music one of the things that George Martin taught them was keep those triads don't don't get fluffy with the chord don't start playing uh major sevens and and uh or sevens and sixes and things like that do those with the vocals uh yeah Add that, add that six in the vocal, which is a very Beatles string. Make a major seven out of, out of that, which you can really hear by the time you get to like Abbey Road, they're doing that left and right. Like that's a whole, uh, you know, here comes the Sun King. Mm -hmm. uh, um, where now I'm blending my titles together. It's, uh, I think it's just called Sun King on that. Here comes the Sun is Harrison's tune, but Sun King is on the same record, hey, whatever. Um, but there's it's these layers of, of harmonies and no instrumentation, but that's what they were doing. And all of a sudden, they started sounding very different from any other band out there. They got the Beatles sound, right? But underneath it, underneath it, it's nothing changed. It was still "Can't Buy Me Love" as the root of everything. Just like "Staying Alive" is that strumming open D guitar. But what the Beatles were doing with instrumental sprinkles but with the vocals creating harmonies that had you know uh that added to the chord right made their sound unique all of a sudden they didn't sound like jerry and the pacemakers or any of the other bands that were coming out of that region or were blowing up because they had an orchestral arranger teach them shit and they took that ball and ran with it this is a good uh i think segue too to sort of circle back around to that aspect where we're talking about People now, the Gibb brothers, the Beatles, who are really pushing the limits. But a lot of times, the engineers and the mix engineers, the producers were also helping to push those limits. Let's circle back around now to that, the aspect of the slave machine and how that came into this whole staying alive track. Because when we talked about that on the phone, man, that, that was mind blowing. Uh, yeah. And, and, um, yeah, for the sake of a, uh, a clean edit. Um, yeah, when when I saw your video, uh, um, 
as I said earlier, I could I could sort of see your just your face sort of you know so like so you're not saying it out loud, but you're trying to figure out what how that was possible. Um, I really saw it when you because you got around to it later on uh, when you're pulling up the drums and it's just a stereo track with with the percussions in there and it's panned already. How mm-hmm. are you getting those pan tracks? Mm-hmm. Um, it's, uh, uh, so again, I don't know if Albert Galutin invented this or if it was someone like that from that, again, that scene, um, like Tom Dowd or, um, that came up with it. Uh, but it got used for a long time by a lot of people, uh, after, um, and I, I used it like I, you know, kid in the 90s i i used the basic version of it with uh, an eight track tascam reel to reel in my living room when i moved to austin uh to uh, da88 one of the the first sort of like uh digital uh sort of cassette uh things and it would and the, the tape machine would have a time code uh, on it that the other machine would read so time code technology was becoming a thing. Um, but you didn't necessarily need, if you've got your arrangement and your recording right, you didn't need time code to create a slave machine. So again, going back, the, the, the basic necessity was more tracks so the Bee Gees could pad their vocals with different textures and, and uh, basically, at that point, I don't really think they were competing with with anyone else at all in terms of upping the stakes of record they were they were perpetually setting the bar all the way through to like 1980 because if you, if you start listening to stuff from you know particularly like 1978 on everyone was trying to rip them off they were trying to get those fatter vocals they were recording a criteria like they did trying to use the same equipment Stuff that people did, like their sound was at the top of the charts the whole time. So like, how are they doing that? How are they getting this? How are they, um, uh, how are they learning these things? So it was almost like they were out. They were just competing with themselves. They were trying to outdo themselves. And the more success they had, the more freedom, the more money, the more okay, we can use an orchestra on this, so we can spend a little more time on this, so we can buy five new tape machines let's build our own studio they were one of the first people to do that um and create custom gear when they did build their own studio one of the things that was unique because it was theirs they the piece of glass that separated the control room to the cutting room was huge which was really unusual um but it was acoustically designed so that they were standing around one mic together uh, uh, yeah, them standing around one mic together would the reflections would bounce off the giant piece of glass in a certain way. And it was all completely acoustically, you know, like um, set up like that. So, yeah, the, the concept is, was really simple, especially if you, it, again, it really relied on you having to get it right. Because for those people watching that don't, have any experience or too much knowledge of tape, the more times you played it, and especially the more times you recorded on it, the more it would degrade. Right. And the noisier it would become and the more muffled the upper end would become. So if you got it right, this trick worked. Um, you'd record stuff onto one machine. Uh, let's say you'd fill up most of your 24 tracks. So you do 15 vocal tracks, double tracks of leads, backgrounds, uh, people singing in, in, in front of a mic together, layering that. Um, you would bounce that down to another tape machine as a stereo pair. <laughs> you'd have already, but you'd already have done that with, say, drums. So that was on the other machine. So what you so that was synced. So when you were layering your vocals, that would then get bounced out. Um, now, the funny thing about that is that, that was sort of the birth 
of what a lot of people now do uh, in the digital world, especially those, including myself, that have analog outboard gear. This was the birth of some mixing. And now people are doing that left and right. And part of the reason they're doing it is kind of for the same reason. Uh, the digital world has, as you just touched on a few minutes ago, has given us way too many options when it comes to how many tracks we can have. Right. So, and it gets really busy really fast. Uh, and it's non-destructive. So you're not committing 100% and you're editing after the fact instead of editing in real time with a razor blade and a piece of tape. So some mixing has become very convenient for people who suddenly figured it out. Like you're grouping everything, all your background vocals can get grouped. Next thing you know, you've got, you don't have a 150 trap mix. You've got a 12 to 20 trap mix because you've got everything going into uh, uh, a bus or an external sun mixer. And you're sort of fine tuning and EQing and compressing that after you've done your original edit. That's slave machining was that, uh, you but you just committed in advance, so you dump things down and then dump things down, and it was already pre you took advantage of a new round of tape compression on your second pass. But what you're left with at the end of the day is, uh, say 24 channels or like mostly you know, sort of 10 to 12 of stereo pairs. Then, then you put the final spit shine on that. Uh, and if something was separated, like you noticed on Staying Alive, because that's what you have, you basically have the, the final slave product. You'll notice that there are three, three or four stereo background vocal pairs. And as you pointed out, uh, they sound like they record in front of a mic and they, um, uh, and there's different presence from a different brother in each of them. So they would have been pre-mixed, but the reason from multiple takes, uh, et cetera, but the decision was made uh, on the final to say, have some separation with those so that they could do some last minute tweaking, uh, muting or balancing. Uh, or option, hey, does the one with Robin being a little more present sound better than the one with Morris or Barry being more present in the background? Right. Or what's the blend of the two? Let's let's not completely commit to that yet because it depends on, you know, do we want more low voice popping out at a certain point? Or, um, and again, a lot of this was faster because everyone just knew each other. You know, Albert Gluten and Carl Richardson knew the brothers. So while the brothers knew each other too well. I tell the story a bunch, but I was sitting in on a session when my dad was still alive. It was him and Barry doing vocals on a track and they were doing backgrounds, but individually they were producing each other. Uh, my dad goes into the booth and he, he sings this line. It's fantastic. Perfect. Just mm, goosebumps. Barry gets on the talk back and he's like, nah, and do it again, Rob. And like they had this like secret language, and my dad sang it one more time. And Barry's like, "Yeah, that was it. I can tell the difference." They could, and then I watched my dad do the same thing with Barry. They just had ears for each other that no one. And the way they came up with harmonies was unique. It's one of the reasons why their stuff is so bare bones underneath because it lets that stuff breathe first some bit of that Beatles thing where you've got it's very simplistic under the, musically unless it's filling in a gap right but it allows their vocal arrangements to breathe so slave machines like allowed that to happen so of course when you've got once you're married to drums and percussion let's not waste eight tracks or more so you end up with a pan stereo pair that you're that you're doing your reaction video to that they committed to that. everything was was committed for the most part and maybe certain edits were done you know in advance you know little trivial things you know like acoustic guitar of course stays on there because you're trying to figure out how much of it how little of it you use as a as a driving thing the electric guitar 
when I was sort of sitting in and helping on a, uh, a remix of that song uh, for them, it was for a VH1 thing years ago. I discovered all that stuff. Um, and, and fun trivia that I got to talk to Barry about because he, he was there for that and remembered a, a lot of it. But the, uh, the breakdown in the middle of the song, that happens a few times, the, I'm going nowhere. Somebody help me, yeah. Um, in your reaction video, you can, when you're playing all of the tracks together, there's a horn part playing underneath there. And on the, on the version that's released, that horn part's not there. Because uh, it never was supposed to be there. What had happened was the original, and this is what I, I called Barry to ask him about this. Because there is an extended, like, uh, like 12 inch mix single version from then. It does have horns in, but not the vocals. Um, it's like an eight minute version of the song that's all spliced up. That's another reason why, they, why things are kept on the mix that you have, because in those days, you, you, you didn't make an eight, nine minute song, but the 12 inch mix was a given. So you kept enough on your master tape to create instrumental mixes, then you sliced it up on say the half inch tape, and then sent that off to, as your extended mix. So that was kind of, that was necessary to keep bonus stuff in that you would mute. But and if you listen to those, those stems again, that life going nowhere section sonically sounds different from the lead vocals. It's, and even the background, it's more present. It's more, uh, it's a little dry, it's more intimate. And of course, mix wise, that's kind of on purpose, but there was a certain happy accident there, but actually being recorded separately and recorded on that last minute on that final slave version. Um, so it has a different presence because they had decided that the horn stab in the, that was the breakdown, was that horn melody. And they decided that it sounded a little too cliched and a little too much like superstition, which had mm. come out not that long beforehand. Yeah. Uh, and so they wrote a vocal melody. They muted the horns and they wrote that vocal melody, which is key part of the song. Like you can't imagine that not being there. Uh, so they wrote that and sang it and double tracked it. Um, and if you, again, if you really listen, there's, it's more bare bones. It's not just more present, but it's obviously not as layered as the other vocals. Mm -hmm. But you wouldn't know that until you compared the two, but it creates this great presence because the other instrumentation kind of drops, the horns go away, and that vocal fills the hole. And again, I didn't think about this. And it's funny because so many guitar player friends of mine geek out over how they never could have come up with that guitar riff. I mean, it's like so odd. It doesn't feel natural as a guitarist. Right. Uh, and from having been like uh, very close and very inspired by Alan Kendall, who was a guitar player, gotten to be close with him later on when I was a teenager and grilling him about stuff like that. Again, this is part of being a band and who comes up with it. I didn't join those dots until I was in a band later when this stuff would happen all the time. And tying in with the superstition thing, that guitar riff essentially started out on a clavinet style keyboard thing that Blue Weaver was playing, but obviously sounded way too much like that. You know, you've got the drum group, you've got the acoustic guitar, you're like mucking around on the keys. And then it's like, oh no, no, that'd be a better guitar riff. Some more unique. And then guitarist starts copying that, but isn't which is makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Because it's not necessarily something you'd come up with on guitar, but it became this iconic guitar line that is not that easy to play. And you would have thought about it like that until someone tells you. And just weird things like that all throughout music history. You know, the, the, the wah pedal for the guitar was invented so that someone could sound like a trumpet, <laughs> like a muted trumpet. <laughs> you know, it's like right. just weird crap like that. And then, but it was a tonal thing. It wasn't until you got around to people like Hendrix that would flap it around to make it just go wow, wow. And then by the time you got into the 70s, people realized that you could be rhythmic and funky with it. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's just those, those innovations uh, change music. And uh, as, as we talk about when we're getting to know each other, 
that's what people need to do more of. People who are as as knowledgeable or experienced uh, need to go back to those roots often. I do. Uh, and younger people who are just getting started that only know the digital domain, think about things that way. A plugin doesn't solve everything. You know, think, split the difference. Yeah, you don't have to edit tape anymore with your bare hands. You don't have to commit, but pretend you do. Yeah, use your plugin like it's a piece of analog gear. Turn it just play off from time to time. Play around with the acoustics of a room. Don't be lazy. Approach everything like you've got one hand tied behind your back. And you'll make better music. You'll make better productions. You'll create better arrangements. Um, don't throw the kitchen sink at it. Because the first rule of mixing, I think, is you're always going to end up taking it away. And if you've got too much stuff going on when you're tracked, you're going to start editing things out that you should have done in, a, in arrangement. But they won't sound natural. You'll just be muting stuff or cutting things out, and it just won't feel the same as if it had been more arranged that way. And, and that's, plus, it's time-consuming. You know, do you really like, how many hours do you want to spend trying to figure out if you want the synth or the organ or the this or the that? You know, like, make a decision early on. You know, one, one, one full day of pre-production on something is going to save you four days of mix time. This has been a moment of clarity with Spencer Gibb. <laughs> <laughs> Dude. I don't know how how do your other guests react to that because they hear it in their cans and then and then like, what the f was that? <laughs> That's usually the first reaction. Then they're like, "Ooh, I want yeah. another one. What can I say now?" Yeah. <laughs> I haven't done that yet. My my ego hasn't hasn't hit that point. Now it has. Now it's me too. And they're like, "Where's my moment of clarity?" Like, I'll say something next. Like, Wasn't that a moment of clarity? <laughs> no, but literally, like the last minute, dude. You were like, you were on a roll right there. Um, that was probably five years of full sale university wrapped up into <laughs> <laughs> wrapped up into like one minute. That was amazing. Well, thank you. Well, I will take it. I will. Um, I'll take it just a little bit further. Yeah. I mean, that, that brings me just to sort of drum at home a little harder. My production partner, Ludek with the orchestral stuff. Uh, he, runs a film composition program at the University of Northern Colorado uh, at their music school, which is a very prestigious music school. You know, they win every like jazz downbeat magazine award every year. It's kind of nutty. It might as well just be called like the UNC jazz magazine. They're all over it. Go Bears. Um, <laughs> and so, so I visited up there a bunch because we were actually working on, on some stuff and uh, incorporating his students into some scores that he was doing and that as a result i met the production team and they got me in for like guest lectures and stuff so i did this sort of like master class thing and socrates garcia is just absolutely awesome he runs that department he um we were setting it up in advance before they flew me in and he was asking me what i wanted to do and so i thought about it and then figured out these were basically all like 17 18 year olds many of whom also played an instrument uh, and, and I knew a bunch of the, the musicians at this point. I'd become friends with some of the students. So my idea was, I'm going to write a song. I already knew who I wanted to sing it. And I also wanted to bring uh, this girl, uh, Samantha Costigan, Sam Costigan. Shameless plug for Sam. You can go find her, uh, her stuff on Spotify, Apple. She's incredible, incredible writer, incredible singer. Um, and we worked together in Austin. She doesn't live too far away when she was out of school, uh, pre-pandemic. Marvel Universe play. 30 years have passed since then. Like, I don't know what year it is. I don't even know if Sam Costigan's still alive. She might be 97, 98 now, I think, maybe. <laughs> uh, but no, she has beautiful stuff, go check it out. Um, I think Sam Costigan music is her stuff, but she has incredible producers here. So I wanted her involved in the production. And it was a good friend of hers that we tapped to sing the song. So I wrote this song. Then I actually threw it to Sam to tweak it out, rewrite it a little bit, and then also tailor it to Alex's vocal range because they sing a lot together. Alex Perry, she just put out a record too. But they, I think they even lived together at that point. So I knew that, that Sam could restructure the song for her, her register, which I studied before I wrote the song, which is 
you know, because I wrote it for her to sing. But I know I might be off on something. And I was, you know, Sam changed the key. I ran through it and she changed some lyrics that exactly what I wanted her to do. So wrote a song. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that's that's important. It's pre-production. Um, you know, who are you writing the song for? Who are you, you know, uh, how are they going to perform it? How are you going to change them? So got to do that in advance. Then I put a band together of, of kids in, who played in various different bands, but I put them together as session players, not as a, people who played in a band together, but say a drummer from, you know, this jazz class and a pianist from this and put the band together. And then the whole concept for the class, which was about like 20 people in the control room, lovely studio up there, very big, was we, to record on tape and conduct it the way that sessions were done when they were like heavy duty pressure sessions. The same way, so you had an artist, in this case, Alex, Alex Baird was the singer. The idea was, this is an Alex Baird record. She's in the vocal booth by herself, she's isolated. This is the song. Uh, these are the session players. We've got half a day to knock this out, you know, sort of Motown style or, yeah. Um, those guys knocked out like 30 songs in half a day, but, um, but that kind of, you know, uh, pulling together um, a session. And the idea was to show the professionalism behind it, but also to show the pressure and how some people embrace pressure and other people don't. They didn't know that's what I was teaching them. Like the band who'd never played together, the, the, I was crossing my fingers that this would happen. They started fighting with each other. Uh, I wanted that to happen, and it did. And the class picked up on it, and they asked questions about it later. They started, and the reason they started fighting with each other is, in, first of all, some of them had bad habits. Like the pianist, uh, in particular, was too heavy with his left hand. He was used to uh, not being that much of a team player, or being the boss of a couple of bands that he played in. So he could, like, there was an arrogance about him mm -hmm. that. That needed to go away fast. One of the reasons I picked it. Uh, <laughs> but, but what frustrates people on that kind of deadline in a destructive environment, and then you can't edit this as smoothly ever as you could, like say in Logic and Pro Tools or do I do a cakewalk or whatever, whatever you know, anything with a mouse. What I knew when I hoped would the band off is when you've, you've made it all the way through a live take. And there's Alex singing in the vocal booth. So she's the only one fully isolated. The rest of the band is in a room. And we've just got baffles and gobos as much as possible to isolate bleed. But we're talking about isolating bleed for a mixed perspective, not, you know, not where someone can play completely differently without there being harmonic stuff bleeding in and, and, and sloppiness. And what I was hoping would happen, and of course it did, after multiple takes, almost through the song, and then someone would flood but the drummers they're thinking this is my best take and now we're like 30 seconds away from the end of the song and the drummer knows they've got to do it again because the bassist screwed up or the pianist screwed up especially if it was maybe some high notes going on that were definitely going to bleed harmonically into other microphones and and then, of course, you've got Alex in the vocal booth who's, sung, who's now sang the song 400 times and she's getting ragged out and she's getting irritated because the band can't get together. And she's not used to necessarily doing it that often. And now it, is she connecting with the emotion anymore? All of these questions I wanted uh, everyone to feel, but I wanted the, the class in the control room to ask those questions about. Like, I wanted them to feel uncomfortable, and they were. And when you explain to them that's why, and that's how deadlines and pressure work, um, they got it. Uh, and the musicians got it. It's like, you don't have time to argue about whether your left hand is interfering with, with the bass frequencies. Just shut up and do it, because the people in the booth are, are hearing it. Um, you know, ego needs to be stripped down. Now, now none of these people, myself included, ever going to have to record that way again. They're never going to have to, period. But the lessons in there about pressure, working with others, what's your priority? Like, 
you know, back in the day, you hired people not just for their versatility or their specificity. You know, Quincy Jones always talks about the key to production being delegation. It's absolutely right. Like, I know I'm a pretty good guitarist. I know that I am a mediocre finger picker. So give me half a day to write and learn a finger picking part, maybe two or three, because, you know, it's going to take muscles to hurt and heal. <laughs> I can do it. But why don't I just call up a buddy of mine who's amazing at that? And just have him knock it out in in one take after I show him here's the basic idea I've got. Right. And he goes, Oh, you know, and then delegation. You know, you find the right person for for the job. Taking it full circle, you Billy and Quincy Jones, Billy Jean. You know, guess what? That's a track that didn't have Toto all over it. Because someone made the decision that Picaro and uh, those are, uh, weren't necessarily the right cats for that song, but they were right for everything else. Yeah, or maybe everyone was sick that day. Who knows? But the point is, if that was the case, happy accident. Mm -hmm. You know, if Picaro was sick and Lukather wasn't around, and then you know what? Maybe it was a case of like we're on a roll here. Let's record this song. Michael's feeling it today because again, you also got to remember who's the artist, who's the centerpiece right. of, of this. Uh, Michael's on a roll; he's feeling good emotionally, and you know, Toto's, you know, all got whatever the '80s version of COVID was um, back then. You know, um, <laughs> probably just a hangover or you know, uh, coming down off of whatever. And but they weren't around, so maybe. Maybe it was Quincy deciding that they weren't the right guys, or maybe it was Quincy calling up other people because he had that kind of Rolodex, as they call it, where it'd be like, all right, you know, we need to cut this because Michael's in the mood. We've got the arrangement, we've got the basic arrangement down. Let's bring in some real people to keep the machine going. So, yeah, those are delegation, necessity. Um, what's the most important part of your session? You know, hiring people or working with people but creative but also you know can you know to excuse the cliche leave their ego at the door including yourself mm -hmm. um these aren't easy lessons to learn i'm not you know i haven't in my entire career been you know guilt free of those things you know uh, in fact, I, I would go as far as to say the opposite because i think that most of us learn things from other people but then have to screw it up ourselves to go, oh, you know what, that person was right when I was like 15. Um, so the least amount of that that you can do, the least right. amount of that, like, well, I'm going to be different from everyone else. The least amount of that, the better. Uh, you're still going to screw up, but just try and keep it in your head. Yeah, that's, um, I think, the more time you have to second guess yourself, the more work you're creating for yourself. And there's a good chance that the quality of your product won't be there. But I also think it can go both ways. One youtube rabbit hole night i used to check it out it's great they're long but they're um they're really cool there's uh peggy mccreary who was an engineer at sunset sound in the 80s um and then susan rogers who was prince's engineer for years at uh um at paisley park both of them have these like sort of master class like interview they're not even master class they're just basically like long like panel type things that are on YouTube where they they actually they talk about Peggy talks a lot about Sons of Sound in general. Just she engineered all the Van Halen stuff there, but she also worked with Prince a lot. Like she did uh, the Purple Rain overdub and mix stuff uh, there for the live things like the song Purple Rain itself cut live from one performance, and uh, and then they overdubbed a couple of things. That was it. And then Susan Rogers talking about Prince and how. That's literally how he lived because he was just like exuding music. And there was one story, one of them, I think it's Susan Rogers and not Peggy McCreary who tells this story because he already had Paisley Park. And so he was working three rooms at a time and multiple people and he wasn't sleeping. He was doing something and it was getting late. And uh, she asks him if he was happy with something or like, I think she felt, I have to rewatch it, but the, both of them are like two hours long. 
if he was happy with something that she thought maybe he wouldn't be. And paraphrasing again, he turns around to her as he's leaving and he goes, I'm not Michael Jackson. I'm not that much of a perfectionist. <laughs> and just walks out of the room. And that's, that's the other way of looking at it because he had so much music coming out of him that he just needed to be done, needed to be put down, needed to be moved on from. Um, that's why he, he, was put, he put out a record a year. You know? um, and later on, he put out more. The only reason he put out a record a year is Warner Brothers wouldn't let him put out more than that because they would interview, interview with touring and other things that were supposed to come after promoting a record. But, you know, um, but then you've got guys like Michael and the Quincy Jones machine that were more uh, at that time thinking about breaking records, you know, being like, we've got to top what we did before. If it takes us three years to do it, with micro focus, let's do it. Let's change the industry in terms of Sonic to this and that, you know, and that was definitely a product of something my family created. Although they were sort of a mix of both, like insane perfectionism, but also the ability to really churn things out. Um, but again, they had their team, you know, and always working on other stuff behind the scenes, always staying busy with other projects that were happening at the exact same time. So somewhere between the two was my family. So I'd be able to churn things out and still be micro perfection they also had the luxury of being brothers so things like vocals which is like <laughs> didn't require you know the extra level of precision but yeah man you have thoroughly opened up my eyes and ears and understanding to a lot of not just about the track we were speaking on to begin with but just the music industry in general during that time and that era which i feel like sometimes i was born in the wrong era I'm like, man, I wish I was born back in those days where I could have. Oh, me too. I've the same. And... Yeah. Yeah. I, I only got to get a glimpse of it, really. Because I did stop trying to learn to engineer when I was like 13. I had a like four, four track set task game thing. And, um, but by the time I'd really gotten that figured out and interned in a few studios, the tape was dead. I did learn how to splice and I did use it and I did record my earliest stuff on it, but um, now nah, I'm glad I got to see it. Right. But I'm too, but I'm too young to have lived it. Um, really, you know. Uh, well, and that leads me to the next question that I had for you for anybody that wants to find out about your work, what you're currently doing. Um, maybe even, I, I don't want to throw this out there just blindly but maybe if they even wanted to contact you and talk about some of this stuff what would be the best place for them to find you do you have a website or i i do um so i've got spencergive.com uh and you know there's also boatloads of social media so uh my facebook is on the official artist page i think that's uh spencer give music um is like at, and then Instagram is at Spencer Gibb, Twitter is at Spencer Gibb. Uh, you know, there's also some photography stuff that's really easy to find through all of those other, other pages. Um, as for my last solo record, which came out in 2018, you can, uh, it's called Let's Start Over. You can find that uh, anywhere you stream stuff. Um, you can also buy vinyl uh, from my website. Uh, there's a very few copies left. Um, they were like, they sold out really fast. We did like a pre-order campaign. Um, and the few that were kept behind were for like emergency stuff and things getting lost in the mail, um, which didn't happen as much as we thought it would. So that was great because everything was all like right between, right before pandemic. Um, right. Okay. But so there's a few copies left, very few. Um, it was pretty much recorded with vinyl in mind um, and got mastered by Bernie Grumman, um, which was one of the highlights of my entire life. Uh, look him up, the guy's a legend. Um, and incredible guy too. Uh, so yeah, that's available. I'm currently um, working on new stuff, uh, which is actually the first time I've publicly mentioned that. So any one of the people that follow me have seen this. Yes, I am working on a new record. Uh, awesome. And I'm also taking this opportunity of, with the studio being shut down um, to really demo things uh, 
a lot of which were played in the final stuff, like at, at my in my little writing room, um, without the pressures of other of the jobs in the way. So it's, it's serendipitous. Um, and yeah, as far as contact, uh, uh, probably the best place to reach me is um, is through. Uh, I would say the, the Facebook official artist page um, will probably be the fastest, even though I'm slow at it uh, with because the, there's so many platforms um, right. to to get in hold of people now. It's like it's crazy you know, email, text, um, but sort of for more business uh, based stuff through the Facebook page, uh, Instagram. I practically never. Uh, <laughs> Check messages unless I'm expecting something or like, um, and the cool thing is most people don't, most people don't know that. Uh, so like when I see a message pop up, I, it pops up on notifications. So I'm surprised. So I read it. Um, <laughs> but, but like with you, I reached out to you through Instagram because I didn't have any other, you can't send messages through YouTube. So, um, I tried that first, but then I figured I'd find other ways to reach you if you didn't get back because I figured there was a good chance you didn't check your Instagram messages. I know so many people have done. And if they don't have notifications turned on, then they're definitely not. Right. Um, so I've narrowed it down to Facebook. There is an email link through my website, but don't use it uh, because that actually goes directly to uh, my old management company um, that. I'm not working with anymore, uh, but they've still got that. Um, and they periodically forward stuff to me that's sort of not uh, junk, but that's usually like endorser kind of stuff. You know, I'll give that email out to uh, guitar manufacturers or the studio equipment stuff. Because mm, gotcha. then it, it gets it gets routed through the, through the old management company and then they'll forward that to me because they'll see that it's important and I'll get back. Or if someone is asking for an interview on a podcast or something. I'll often direct them to that um, if I don't have a personal connection. So, yeah, if you want to ask uh, questions like something about this, um, then uh, Facebook is probably the fastest way to get me because I'll check that like once in a few days. Um, and yeah, and when this airs, if you're watching it, well, if you're watching me talk right now, it's it's airing. Um, you know, I'll probably go down a late night rabbit hole of uh, um, replying to comments. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, um, yeah, I, I got one more curveball question before we call this, uh, before we call it a night. And this curveball question is one I ask every single person who I have on my show, uh, it's a good lighthearted way to end the conversation. Uh, but the first, it's a two part question. Mm -hmm. The first part of the question is what is your favorite color? Hmm. I would say, um, I go through phases with colors where something is really a thing for a period of my life. Uh, so, but in general, uh, it's red, but I go through other phases. Like I'm kind of in a purple phase right now. Um, and you know, it's been orange in the past, <laughs> sometimes shades of blue. Right. But if you think about it, you think about purple, you think about orange, they're, they're shades of red. They're in that spectrum. So, um, and it's often is shades of red, like deep burgundy, Merlot kind of colors, um, very, very much so. Um, yeah, like if you really, really be anal about it, it's, it's a shade of red. It's somewhere between like red and purple. It's got like, is with, if you had to pin me down and be like, pick a color, that's what it is. It's not quite burgundy. It's not quite a, it's a frequency of color. It's not purple. It's not, it's not red. So, yeah. So what does Chew that, on that one. <laughs> what does that ethereal color that you just described, 
What does it taste like? Um, I can't answer like from like a synesthesia perspective. Uh, I do actually have a reaction to that. I can't say it tastes particularly like something, but it's both bitter and sweet. Um, if you imagine a berry that you that doesn't exist, like make up a berry in your head that uh, that is just different. It's not a blackberry. Not a, it's not a raspberry. It's not a blueberry. It's not too sweet. It's not too bitter. Um, definitely not a blueberry. Uh, but it's it's something like that. It's somewhere, yeah. It's somewhere between. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's it's something like a wine. How about that? There you you go. know what I mean? It's, it's something. <laughs> something. It's something like a wine. I think that's probably yeah. the most thought that's ever been put into this curveball question that I've, I've ever been given, dude, that's, that's amazing. That just goes to show how creative of a mind you have. And I had to say, this has been a moment of clarity with Spencer. <laughs> <laughs> I just threw that one in there just for you. <laughs> well, no, I, I appreciate it. And someone, um, uh, yeah, like someone should name that color because I can't. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, I greatly appreciate your time and all of the, thank you for yours. All of the energy that you brought to the to the podcast today, to the, the show, if you're watching this on YouTube, it will be on both mediums. By the way, all of the links that he's already mentioned to find him, I'll put those in the description of the video as well as in the show notes of the podcast, and as well as some of the links to the other things that we've talked about, the Blindfold EQ by Audio Thing, and also yeah, yeah. The, uh, the Bee Gees documentary, uh, Mend a Broken Heart. That's going to be in there as well. Anything else that we should put in the show notes that you'd like to direct them to um, um no i think that covers it oh, um uh and if there's a you know i'll i'll talk to uh grant one of the authors um i know you can find it on amazon uh but the the uh, the decades book um right okay. right now the the 60s and also them as kids in the 50s book is out uh, if you do want to learn more about like the backstory of the Bee Gees, but also like the technical recording and writing stuff from the 60s 70s book like i said comes out soon um i think it's in the fall because i know they just uh finished edits on it um and but yeah uh the hbo how can you win a broken heart uh, for sure um yeah i think you covered all the bases Awesome. And I hope you've got enough to edit. Oh, yeah. Man, yeah. We've been at it. <laughs> it's going to take me a while to edit this one for sure. But I mean, there's going to be so many yeah. nuggets that I want to bring out in this. So once again, man, I greatly appreciate your time and the energy that you've invested into this. No, thank you. And, um, thank you. If Thanks for having me. And if there's anything that I can do for you, I know that I'm kind of limited in my abilities and my reach only can go so far, but if I can share anything for you when the new album comes out, let me know. I'd love to share that Thank on you. the socials. Um, yeah, just anytime you need anything, hit me up. Let me know. Awesome, and and likewise. And let's uh, um, when you look at the time, like it doesn't feel like that much time went by. That's uh, that's really cool, but also uh, scary and creepy at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but again, thank you and uh, Justin. Awesome. We'll talk to you later, buddy. Bye. Bye. Bye.